Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. We are doing a bit of an experiment today, a little bit of a daring experiment. Um, and so my fellow experimenters here, uh, we actually have seven different groups represented who are all working on the fascinating topic of exercise and EVs. So we will, um, we will have some short presentations, but first of all, we're going to have an overview. And so for all of you who are on the call, I'd just like to remind you that we will be um, we'll be recording this session, putting it on YouTube. If you miss something, you can always look at it there. And while the session is in progress, please put your, your comments and your questions, and I know you'll have a lot of them, um, into our chat box. And then at the end of the presentations, if we ever reach the end, we will, um, we will allow you to unmute yourselves, um, to show your videos if you like, and to discuss with our presenters today. And so this topic of exercise and EVs, I've, I've entitled this a relay race because we're gonna be going from one group to another, uh, but we're gonna start out um, with, with an overview. And so Steve, I'd like to invite you to uh, go ahead and start sharing your screen um, and tell us a little bit about the, the background of the topic that we've chosen for today. Thanks so much. Well, first off, thank you, Ken, for, for organizing this and, and inviting us all together, because I think we all share a common passion for, for not only EVs, but the implications they have. Um, so, you know, with that said, you know, I, I chose to put this into the framework sorry, of obesity. I think we're all aware that uh, disease rates have increased uh, in the United States as well as worldwide. And, and some of the most common of uh, causes of disease are heart disease, cancer, stroke, and diabetes, to name a few. And, and a culprit perhaps in that and in connecting us to some of the underlying etiology is this idea of insulin resistance uh, and or relations to the vasculature, whether it's endothelial dysfunction or arterial stiffness. And in some ways, a lot of attention has been placed there, but there's a black box, if you will, in the clinical world in understanding what's actually driving that. Um, some people have raised the high blood glucose or blood lipids, but that doesn't answer the entire story. You know, in fact, some estimates suggest 50% is a black box. We still don't really know. And, and in some ways, that's why I label this of thinking, could EVs fill some of that cardiovascular disease black box? And there's a multitude of those. You know, I think for this audience, I don't need to get into the specificity of the variety and the complexity of the extracellular vesicles and really the different domains and sizes. But I think it's at least important to recognize that there are different bodies that we could be considering and discussing and perhaps out of part of the conversation that the co-speakers will all be highlighting a bit. But these could play particular roles within the etiology of, of disease. And, and connecting some of that is just a general idea that these EVs come from a host of different cells. And I only listed a few here, um, as again, there's other sites such as even neuronal cells that are not uh, listed directly that could play roles in releasing EVs within the body. And generally speaking, these are thought to be elevated in different disease states like obesity and diabetes. And whether it's uh, factors such as uh, high blood glucose or high blood lipids that promote some of this is, is somewhat debatable. You know, uh, I'd like to, in particular on this slide, just acknowledge Uta Erderberger, who's, who's here with me co-presenting uh, work. But, you know, years ago, we had put together a, a review article with Natalie Eichner, just highlighting the complexity in which the EV may play in regulating not only endothelial dysfunction, but perhaps even influencing insulin's action in the body relating to some of these obesity-related comorbidities. And there's a host of cargo that these EVs have that might play direct roles. And, I, and I'm excited to see the variety of speakers we have and the work that they'll discuss. I, I raise that idea <clears throat> because when thinking about exercise, I think we all share a passion that exercise in many ways could be viewed as a drug itself. If we think about just the titration and the dose of exercise, these could play unique roles in a variety of tissues and maybe some classic physiology in regulating muscle metabolism or the vasculature, as well as even liver and adipose tissue. But whether it's purely aerobic exercise or weightlifting is somewhat debatable and what promotes the best results. Uh, 
you know, how does food interact with the exercise? And perhaps even considerations of alcohol intake or sleeping could be other components. I raise these because as we think about exercise in general, we know that there's a host of health benefits. Um, to name insulin sensitivity and endothelial function alone doesn't do exercise justice in that way. But in that regard, it's probably fair to wonder if exercise could mediate some of these beneficial effects in the body through an EV specific mechanism. And how exercise impacts EVs uh, across different subtypes, as well as specific cargo, is an area needing more work. And, and that's why I'm so uh, humbled to be a part of uh, this lineup here today, as uh, you know, Ken beautifully uh, put together here a, a host of individuals that that I'm just honored to be a part of. There's a variety of different topics that that uh, these individuals have contributed to areas of work, uh, and I won't spill all the beans right now, as uh, I can appreciate each person has has their story to tell. Um, but I look forward to uh, seeing everyone's talks, and again, I thank you, Ken, for organizing the event. All right. Well, thanks very much. And I will actually invite you and Uta to kick us off with your data presentation uh, before we move on to, to the next one. Fantastic. So, so with that, Uta and I would like to share a bit of a story we've been working on together related to metabolic and vascular insulin sensitivity. This started over seven years ago, I suppose, when really we began just to ask a basic question of, does exercise intensity influence EVs? Uh, particularly, we were interested in endothelial cell-related EVs. And, and this is some data that we had published where by, when we looked at high-intensity interval training in older adults with prediabetes, we found that in particular, one marker of endothelial cells uh, went down, whereas continuous exercise caused quite a robust increase in these EVs. And we found this was directly correlated with gains in insulin sensitivity, but here also showing fitness levels. And this really promoted an idea for us that exercise intensity may affect EV responses, uh, but more work is needed in our view on how it can impact the endothelium. So with Emily Heaston as a doctoral student conducting her dissertation, we ended up performing one bout of exercise at moderate intensity exercise, and it expended about 400 calories. And we were curious of whether this amount of exercise can influence not only endothelial function and vascular insulin sensitivity, but could this medi be mediated through EV specifically? And, and we did this in a few ways. So highlighting here for you is that when we looked at the EVs themselves, we had looked at first a baseline condition where there was no exercise. And what we observed was that insulin itself caused a slight reduction, uh, statistically significant reduction in EVs. And then upon exercise, where we look here on the right side of the screen, we'll see that not only did the fasting state EVs go down 16 hours after the bout of exercise, but the effect of insulin was actually accentuated and it was even greater. This was very exciting to us thinking that not only does insulin infusion in the body directly lower EVs, but also that exercise can potentiate these effects in the system. So that was curious to us and really starting to think about, well, how does this play roles in the vasculature again? What are some of the mechanisms given that EVs have been shown to particularly influence GLUT4 translocation in adipocytes and other cells as well? We wondered, could some of this cargo perhaps within the EV influence the action of insulin on the vessels? And in collaboration with Brent Isaacson, as well as a postdoctoral fellow, Tristan Raglan, we, we assessed this. And we found that EVs uh, specifically did increase endothelial function or insulin-induced vasodilation in healthy individuals, but not people with metabolic syndrome. So to, to share here the data that we published, uh, the open bars are lean, healthy individuals, whereas this bottom bar is actually a metabolic syndrome participant, whereas the gray bars are buffer only. So here by the buffer, we're able to look at just the effect of insulin alone on vasodilation, and we saw an increase as we'd expect. But when we added to the buffer healthy EVs, we found that insulin had generally increased vasodilation upon uh, this uh, uh, protocol. 
But you can see here that was completely lost in patients with metabolic syndrome. This was suggesting to us on levels that restoration or perhaps improvements in insulin sensitivity could in part be related to an EV specific mechanism. And we're currently interested in pursuing more work trying to understand how exercise may rescue some of this in patients with metabolic syndrome and metabolic disease. And, and wondering what is the exact cargo, whether it's nitric oxide or microRNA, is something we're very interested in pursuing. So with that, there's a lot of individuals to thank um, uh, within the group, and I look forward to hearing everyone else's talk. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, and let's move on now to Melbourne, Australia. We'll take a quick flight down under. Um, thank you, Jason and MC, for joining despite the very late hour. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm MC from Swinburne University, um, Melbourne, Australia. So today I'll be sharing some of our work in um, aging and also NAD metabolism. So NAPT is one of the rate limiting enzymes that regulates NAD productions. So NAD is an essential cofactor involved in multiple cell processes and also has an impact in aging. So previous study has shown that um, the circulating forms of NAPT or known as ENAPT is exclusively contained within EVs. And the amount of ENAPT within EVs has been shown to decline with age in human so causing a decreased production of NAD. So this leads us to the questions, can exercise increase the release of ENAPT in EVs and rescue the decline as we age? So we recruited healthy male adults to perform a 20 minute cycling exercise at moderate intensity. EVs were isolated from pre and post exercise blood plasma and the participants were grouped based on their age and aerobic fitness into young unfit, young fit, mature unfit, and mature fit. So firstly, the particle analysis shows um, that the EVs isolated the average 80 to 90 nanometer in size, and the abundance of THG 101 was significantly increased after exercise, with no differences observed between the groups. We then measure the amount of ENAPT in both pre and post exercise EVs. So what we found is that the young fit participants were the only group that had a significant increase in ENAPT um, after exercise. While in contrast, um, the mature unfit group show no changes after exercise. But interestingly, the mature fit group show similar increase in EV ENAPT release after exercise to the young unfit group. So this suggests that um, a greater aerobic fitness, possibly resulting from regular exercise, may overcome some of the age-related decline in ENAPT release. Overall, this data suggests that age and aerobic fitness of an individual may affect um, the release of NAPT in EVs after exercise. The next question we ask is, do these exercise EVs have a functional effect on the recipient cells? So we first confirmed that EVs derived from exercise in humans can be taken up by C2C12 mouse skeletal muscle cells through sex that images taken using confocal microscopy. We then measured the NAD activity after the uptake. So we saw um, significant increases in NAD abundance after exercise EVs from both young groups were delivered to the recipient cells as compared to control. Although not significant, we also observe increases in NAD after the delivery of exercise EVs from the mature group. We also measure sirtuin one activity, which is the downstream pathway of NAD. And we saw similar increases after exercise EVs from both young groups were delivered. So these results suggest that the pathway downstream of ENAPT can be activated after exercise EVs are internalized in the recipient cells. So decline in ENAPT and the subsequent decrease in NAD productions can be an issue during aging. So this can trigger multiple age-associated diseases, including metabolic disorders, neurodegenerative diseases, et cetera. So our findings suggested a pathway for the systemic delivery of ENAPT through the EVs released during exercise to maintain or to offset the age-related decline in tissue NAD levels and most importantly, we think that exercise has an important role in improving health during aging, partly through the release of EVs containing essential factors. 
So yeah, I'd like to thank um, our lab members and our collaborators. Thanks very much, MC. Mm -hmm. We will now get in our transporter and head over to Germany where Eva Maria Albers is going to present. Okay, thank you very much, Ken, for the invitation to this uh, group of people. Uh, and so I would like to start out by uh, naming the people who contributed to this. So this was a collaboration between the Institute of Developmental Biology and the Sports Medicine Department at University of Mainz. So between my group and the group of Pericles Simon and Alexandra Brahma actually was that per, the person in the lab uh, working in the two of our groups uh, really pushing this project and unfortunately she's sick today and cannot speak. Uh, maybe, maybe she's following uh, online and um, we will see her later, but let's see. Okay, so um, we can see our publications on that topic down there. And after our pilot study that we had published in 2015, we actually aimed at a more closer phenotyping of these EVs that are released during uh, exercise and um, to understand the, their origin and then maybe in the next step uh, to approach uh, their function. So what we did uh, is uh, we per performed a quite um, elaborate uh, study uh, involving several different isolation procedures and also characterization procedures and also including uh, DNA quantification. And this is published in uh, the 2019 study basically, and also the 20, 000, uh, 2021 study. So uh, to keep, to make that story short, um, so we um, took blood samples at three different um, uh, time points before, during exercise, RQ09 is about around the anaerobic threshold time point and uh, after exercise. And looking at EVs by Western blotting and other techniques, we found uh, in the increase of many of the EV markers, which was basically looking at the typical EV markers about twofold and the platelet markers actually increased up to eight to, or tenfold. So we then performed a uh, comprehensive uh, multiplexed EV analysis using the Maxplex platform from Miltini. And um, this is only showing the CD81 EVs. And there we could reveal several markers, surface markers uh, that uh, can be associated with different cell types, uh, largely uh, lining or coming from within the circulation. Um, which were increasing. And then reading these markers, we uh, concluded that these EVs that are released during exercise are coming from platelets, endothelial cells, uh, lymphocytes, monocytes, and also APCs. We could actually not detect muscle EVs, uh, which may not mean anything, but at least the markers we used were not positive. And uh, we know that other people uh, can detect these EVs. And there is still a debate around that, whether muscle really contributes or whether these EVs rather stay in the, in the interstitium. So maybe one point, other point that I would like to mention is that I acted, actually had expected that we see differences between CD9, CD63 and CD81 immunocaptured EVs then analyzed via this Maxplex platform. But basically, um, all these techniques that we use for isolation revealed the same pattern indicating that all of these EVs carry these um, tetra spanning markers. Maybe a little bit a more uh, definite pattern with the CD9 EVs, that's, that's kind of expected, sorry for that. Um, but basically the pattern was the same. So we also performed a DNA quantification on these EVs uh, because there's always uh, the, the debate, do EVs carry um, DNA or not? So we checked uh, whether these uh, bead isolated EVs carry DNA and quantified this in relation to total plasma, the flow through that was coming after the beads or before the beads and the beads. And as you can see here, uh, the total uh, uh, DNA pool in plasma is increasing. That was known before. 
what did I do now? That was known before. Um, and also the DNA associated with the EVs. But the fraction of DNA that is associated with the, with the EVs is a very minor fraction, no, only 0.12% uh, of the total DNA is associated with the EVs. And this is surface and inside. We then further performed the DNA's digestion on these EVs, uh, um, beat isolated EVs. And what you can see, again, there is the increase of the DNA associated with the EVs, which is then going down to a basal level. And this remains at the resting levels. And this indicates that the EVs that are released during the exercise actually contain their DNA on the surface. They capture the, the free DNA that is present pro probably in the plasma as a kind of a corona DNA, but that it's not inside the DNA, which I think is an, uh, a finding um, that, that, that should just be noted. Well, okay, now to summarize that, um, I think uh, we could show with this phenotyping that these exoes, how we call them, um, are coming from, largely coming from cells lining the circulation or cells within the circulation. Um, there are many functions they may contribute to, many groups, so most of them here in uh, also presenting, are now starting to reveal this function. This will be a very interesting subject for the future. They may contribute to multi-organ signaling, even approaching distant organs, and uh, the DNA on the surface may also contribute to these functions. So, thank you for the um, attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, questions later. Fascinating. Thanks so much, uh, Eva Maria. Uh, let's go now across the Atlantic and we're going to go to Ottawa and Dylan. All right. So first of all, I just wanted to say that the EV Club is such a fantastic initiative for our community and it's an honor to present here. Um, I'm going to share quickly a, a little bit of work from a small collaborative project that my group started a few years back. And, and what I want to do is I want to highlight uh, Akrama Bulbagai, who's the PhD student who performed this work, uh, Dr. Christy Adamo, who's uh, my colleague in the Faculty of Health Sciences, who led the exercise physiology portion of the study, and then Vera Tang, who many of you may know, who directs our nanoscale flow cytometry uh, facility here. So my laboratory has a long-standing interest in the medium-large extracellular vesicle population, um, you know, the generally the one that's enriched in microparticles or microvesicles, and we employ flow cytometry to identify EVs in plasma and quantify them. Uh, we certainly weren't the first lab to, um, sorry, to uh, to do this, but we've put out a number of studies, uh, like many of these labs, linking increases in levels um, of endothelial and platelet EVs uh, to vascular stress. And of relevance to today's talk uh, was a study we published in 2021 where we showed that women with type 1 diabetes um, who had high levels of endothelial extracellular vesicles uh, were at increased risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes, in including respiratory uh, complications. Uh, now, the most obvious question with data like this is what can be done to reduce the risk? And as, as Dr. Mellon presented earlier, uh, exercise as a drug is, is a particularly appealing option, uh, particularly in pregnancy where interventions are often limited. So working with Christy Adamo's group, we started a project to look at the impact of exercise and pregnancy on EV levels, and this is sort of the first study from that collaboration. Uh, and in that first study, we focused on the impact of a single acute bout of exercise, and we compared healthy pregnant and non-pregnant women. So you can see the study on a graphic. Um, we had healthy pregnant and non-pregnant women. They were given, after fasting, they were given a standardized snack, and, a, and then they would did a baseline profiling of their resting heart rate and heart rate variability. Uh, then we took a blood sample and then a standardized exercise of 30 minutes on the treadmill uh, at about 40 days, about moderate intensity. Um, uh, and then we collected a second blood sample afterwards. Uh, and from the plasma samples, from these blood samples, we quantified um, the EVs. Um, we isolated the EVs by circulation, so the 20,000 G pellet and quantified by flow cytometry. And if you're interested in our methodology, then you can follow the link in this QR code and you'll get the MyFlowSite EV table uh, with the full details on that. Uh, so here are our results. Um, these graphs are of four separate EV uh, subpopulations, uh, total EVs, which we described as an X and five uh, positive staining EVs, uh, endothelial, which were labeled with CD144, 
uh, platelet with uh, CD41 and leukocyte with CD45, and non-pregnant women are on the left, uh, and pregnant women are on the right. And, and really, to summarize, um, the only area where we saw any differences was in the area of endothelial EVs, where in the non-pregnant population, we saw a reduction in EVs post-exercise, uh, whereas in the pregnant uh, population, we didn't see a reduction post-exercise. Uh, we also looked at relationships between EV measures and uh, EV levels and measures of fitness, but we saw very little there except some suggestion of a positive relationship between platelet EVs and maximum speed uh, during exercise. Uh, and again, that was only significant in non-pregnant individuals. So the reasons before the differences between pregnancy and, and non-pregnant individuals are not really clear. Um, you know, when we first saw the endothelial data, we wondered about immune-mediated clearance or extravasation, but You'd expect that that would be the case, then all of the EV populations would follow the same pattern, which they don't. Um, but regardless, it's probably best to temper conclusions too much because there's a very healthy population with a fairly small sample size. So it'll be interesting to see what happens when we you know, look at sustained exercise regimen uh, in a larger population. Thanks. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, let's hop on the bus and a couple of days later, we'll be in Manitoba. Aisha. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ken, for uh, the introduction and invitation to participate. I'm really, really excited to show some uh, data that we have. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Marlin for setting up the stage and uh, the speakers before me. So I'm going to jump right into this and um, show some data that we have on skeletal muscle-derived EVs. And we asked ourselves a very basic question, which was, what is the effect of skeletal muscle-specific EVs on exercise-induced adaptations? And to answer this, we used an in vitro model where we took myoblasts, C2C12 myoblasts, differentiated them into myotubes, and electrically stimulated them for four days. And this video here shows what the cells, these myotubes would look like when they're contracting. And afterwards, we isolated EVs from the cell culture media. Uh, this is what the system looks like in real life, and this was done in collaboration with Dr. Go Joe Gordon at uh, the Children's Hospital at U Manitoba. And the adaptations, uh, the, the pros for this model is that you see adaptations in four days that you would normally see in weeks and months in mouse or human models. And of course, we can really drill down on the effects of skeletal muscle specific EVs and, and manipulate the system uh, with much more ease than it is um, possible to do in vivo. Uh, we've used this system before. Many people have used this uh, in exercise-induced adaptation labs. Uh, we used it for an acute STEM paper that we published recently, um, but today I'll be showing you some of the chronic STEM effects uh, from these uh, uh, EVs derived from the system. Uh, so uh, this is work that we uh, has been done primarily by my uh, PhD student patients, OB, and with help from my uh, lab techs in USA. Uh, and we have bio, uh, we have uh, pre-printed the results. So what we did was we used this model, we isolated EVs, and we fully characterized them in line with uh, the MySafe guidelines. Uh, we used differential ultracentrifugation to isolate EVs. We used TRPS as well as DLS methods to, you know, in combination show that with each day of stimulation, there's an increase in EV concentration. There seems to be a synergistic effect in the last two days. Um, and there's extensive characterization done in the paper that you can read online on, on, on by our archive for now. Uh, but I think uh, what I'm going to focus on is the effect of these EVs on mediating mitochondrial biogenesis. So what we did was we isolated EVs after each day of stem. Uh, we took conditioned media as well as EV-depleted media as negative controls, uh, and we put them on just regular myoblasts for four days, and then we looked at the effect on uh, mitochondrial biogenesis using different markers. And I'm going to show you just one piece of data, which I think is one of the most important um, uh, that, you know, evidence that we have generated so far, uh, and this is uh, showing oxygen consumption. So this is maximal oxygen consumption rates uh, uh, analyzed using the seahorse bioanalyzer. Uh, this is cells that were treated in blue with PBS. This is control EVs. And this here in purple are the EVs that were isolated from the skeletal muscle cells after four days of stim. And you can see that there's an increase in one of the hallmark measurements of mitochondrial biogenesis, which is an increase in oxygen consumption. Now, what is really, really cool is that if we pre pre-treat these EVs with proteins K, we actually see that this effect dissipates. So 
whatever is causing this adaptation is clearly either in the corona or on the surface. Uh, and we see the same uh, when we are treating EVs in combination with Triton X that perturbates the, the EV membranes. Uh, this is one measurement. We've measured this in many different ways. Uh, we've looked at COX activity, which is an enzyme that is, you know, directly linked with increases in mitochondrial biogenesis. And we saw much of the same adaptations here that chronic exercise derived EVs from skeletal muscle can increase mitochondrial biogenesis. We've done Western blotting, we've done mitotracker staining, and again, everything points in the same direction, which is very exciting and interesting. Uh, and importantly, we did not see any effect on mitochondrial biogenesis in EV depleted and conditioned media controls. Uh, I will not show the data right now because of time, but we've done a proteomic analysis on these EVs that have been isolated, and we're finding that our answers are leaving us with more questions, uh, in specifically in trying to find out the mechanisms of release, uh, the cargo selection, and whether these effects are uh, self-specific. So. Obviously, the work is done by the awesome team that I have uh, and all of the collaborators and the funding agencies that have supported this work so far. So thank you very much for listening. And I'll pass the baton back to Ken. Thank you, Aisha. Well, I was just going to use that baton that baton reference to me. Yeah, very nice. So um, the baton now goes to Sira and Aya in Finland. So how, hi everyone. My name is Eija Laakkonen and I am an associate professor at the at the uh, Faculty of Sport and Health Sciences and Gerontology Research Center at the University of Jyväskylä and it's a real pleasure to be here. One of my group's main research lines is to investigate the molecular mechanisms leading to physiological decrements during menopause and for that purpose I have collected ESMI study. And today, Sira Karvinen, who was earlier a postdoctoral researcher in my group and is now in the, in the process of establishing her own research group, presents our recently published exercise study, which you see the title here. And I also want to thank all the, the uh, co-authors who helped us to build up this study. So Sira, go ahead. Thank you, Eja, and thank you for having us also from my behalf. So I will briefly go through first the study design, and then I will focus on the results. So our study question was, does estrogen availability affect women's response to exercise? And to study this, we needed two groups of women who would differ from their estrogen status. And for the current study, we had 14 postmenopausal women, of which seven use estrogen based hormonal therapy and seven were non users. And to study the effect of estrogen status and acute exercise on systemic signaling, these women did a maximal test on a bike ergometer. And we harvested plot plasma samples before, immediately after, and one hour after the exercise. From the plasma, we isolated EVs and HDL particles via gradient ultracentrifugation that was followed by SAC. And from the isolated particles, we examined small non-coding RNA species that are known to coordinate several biological processes. First, we examined the two study groups together before the acute exercise. And our results revealed that EV and HDL particles have a distinct small RNA content. In EVs, the most abundant species were microRNAs, and in HDL, small RNAs that originated from ribosomal RNA. However, when we took a look at the top 100 sequences, the microRNAs were the most abundant in both of the carrier particles. And hence, we continued the analysis with the microRNAs. When examining the hormone therapy users and non-users separately, we found something interesting. Only the hormone therapy users exhibited a response to exercise in the microRNAs that were carried via EVs. There were no changes in the non-users. The same phenomenon was found also in HDL particles. We then examined the possible function of the estrogen and exercise responsive microRNAs. And we found that the microRNAs coordinate, for example, for box O protein and MAP key signaling pathways. So both of these signaling pathways share a role in coordinating energy metabolism. 
Hence, what we conclude is that estrogen availability affects women's response to exercise. And we also speculate that these estrogen responsive microRNAs may participate in coordinating energy metabolism in response to an acute bout of exercise. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Aya and Sierra, for the, the results here. We are actually coming to the end of our relay race, and to take us across the finish line is Martin Whittem from, uh, from the UK. Many thanks, Ken. It's a, a well-traveled relay. Um, many thanks for your efforts in, uh, in putting this together. Okay, so um, ourselves, much like others on the call, I've spent time of late trying to test the fundamental hypothesis that small extracellular vesicles are released into circulation during exercise. And of course, with any EV related question, um, there's always a bit of a, a concern or uh, influence of isolation method or analytical approach. What I hope to show you in the next couple of minutes is data that supports this hypothesis using a, a combination of, of different methods. So first of all, we did some uh, quantitative proteomic analysis. Um, here we're isolating platelet-free plasma from individuals carrying out around about a one hour bout of exhaustive cycling exercise. And um, an important point to get across here is um, when we do the proteomic analysis, we always inject the same amount of protein, okay? So uh, if it is the case that uh, during exercise, there are more EVs in circulation, and we do in a fantastic uh, effort at uh, isolating very, very pure EVs and then load the same amount of them on the uh, resting and exercise uh, context, then we potentially run the risk of actually normalizing out that quantitative difference. So here we've done a, a really crude uh, isolation of two bouts of uh, centrifugation at 20,000 G. Uh, on the right of your screen, you can see our attempts to sort of characterize uh, those particles that we derive using NTA and cryo-EM. But importantly, when we look at the prote proteomic data in its entirety, um, you can see that the, the, the approach is, is highly sensitive at um, detecting with quite high abundance some of the putative small EV markers, which um, reinforces the approach, but I think also reminds us that um, although 20,000 G is a crude isolation uh, technique, we do potentially do see some uh, small EVs in that prep, which is important because when we actually look at the exercise data itself, um, expressed here as a series of uh, volcano plots, um, we see with exercise quite a specific enrichment of proteins that uh, are part of uh, protein classes that constitute uh, an extracellular vesicle and a small extracellular vesicle. So we, we think this uh, adds uh, something to the, the literature with some quite unbiased data. Um, irrespective of, of what you want to call them, I guess, uh, we also found some, uh, some really interesting signaling molecules in this proteomic analysis. Um, of course, we've got to be slightly mindful of potential contamination, uh, but ultimately this has been uh, some of these signaling molecules, metabolic enzymes have been uh, the, the focus of some of our work of late and also um, uh, I'm sure in the, in the coming months and years uh, with a more sort of hypothesis driven approach. Which is a great segue to our uh, other um, examination of this hypothesis. Um, here we've analysed uh, again platelet free plasma uh, in individuals carrying out this time uh, high intensity intermittent exercise and we've used the uh, excellent exoview instrument so this um, circumvents the need to uh, have a pre-isolation step um, we load uh, fresh plasma actually uh, forward plasma i should say onto uh, these microchips the microchip immobilizes the ev and then through uh, the um, the use of immunofluorescence uh, literally counts uh, tetraspanning positive vesicles. So the take home there was with this analysis, uh, we see an increase in the number of CD9, CD63 and CD81 positive EVs with the exercise bout uh, with medium to, to large effect sizes. Um, 
with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators and co-workers. And uh, thanks again for uh, the invite to, to share. Thanks very much, Martin. And thanks to all of our speakers. In fact, I think we need to do a big virtual round of applause here. Because as most of you know, when you give a scientist five minutes, they're going to take 20. <laughs> we all like to talk about our work, and it's really amazing. Um, I think that all of our speakers have done so well in keeping to the time. Um, so, so we've gotten a lot of information here um, in just in just uh, just over half an hour. Um, and now it's time to uh, to maybe come back to some themes, come to some specific questions that people have. And so I am going to go ahead and allow our audience members to unmute themselves to start their videos if they'd like. Um, so if you put a question or comment in the chat box, please be ready to, um, to unmute and engage with our presenters. Um, and I'd like to start here. Um, also, if you haven't put a question in, it's, it's not too late, so go ahead and do that. So we'd like to go to somebody right now who knows a lot about exertion because she was actually the the co-chair of our ISEB annual meeting, not once, but twice, and that's Sophie Rome. Sophie, thanks for joining, um, and you have a very nice, um, nice question here. Uh, yes, I have written my question uh, in the chat. Uh, it, yeah, it was very interesting. Uh, it was a question for the for the second talk. Actually, the, the Ibis from the blood was regulating a CERT-1 in the myoblast, and known that uh, the down regulation of CERT1 uh, induce uh, the differentiation of uh, the, 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 the muscle cells. So I was thinking maybe, do we have data showing that uh, EVs from blood during physical activity uh, have an action of uh, this, uh, um, this uh, differentiation? Can they, can they uh, induce differentiation or proliferation? I don't know. Uh, so can we imagine that during uh, physical activity, blood um, EVs would uh, participate in the renewing of the, the skeletal muscle and the maintenance of uh, muscle mass? So this was a kind of general question for everyone because uh, I don't have the, the answer yet. Right. Uh, thank you for the questions. So to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there is um, data available um, like using exercise EVs to look at muscle regeneration. Um, but there is a paper came out in 2021. Um, they took um, blood EVs from younger animals and um, they saw that um, it helps to enhance the functions um, of age muscles in older animals. So I think there is certainly possible like high chances that um, exercise EVs could help in um, muscle regeneration, but we just need um, more data or evidence to show that. Okay, thank you. Any other panelists here with a response? Martin. Yeah, just again, we've got to be super careful, but um, one of the proteins that we detected in exercise EVs was uh, TGF beta. Obviously, it's something that's uh, very much involved in in muscle regeneration so uh, we haven't done any work on on, on that um, but it's obviously something that, that could be looked at in, in in the future anyone else if not we will thank you uh sophie and we'll go to our next question which is from genevieve go ahead sorry i hope i don't know if this works um, I was really interested to know if you have any characterization of the DNA you found associated with the EVs. This is for Eva Crema Albers, I think the second talk. Yeah, yeah, thank you. For, this is actually an excellent question and we were thinking about this too. But um, we did not have the opportunity yet to do it, but it's basically on a kind of to-do list and we are quite interested. It would be quite interesting to see that. So yeah, thank you for the question. It's a good point and it should be analyzed. I agree. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to interject here a question of my own and that is, um, you know, to, to what extent is EV release during exercise related to the type of exercise, you know, so high impact exercise versus low impact exercise. Um, I wonder if if some of our our panelists could expand on that a bit more. 
so maybe I start with that. I mean, I mean, we also this is a, this is a very good point, and we would have to do many many studies to really resolve that. Uh, maybe we have a little indication because we took the three time points, yeah, uh, the the pre the RQ, which is a kind of a not so heavy load, but we see a slight uh, release already at the lower loads. So I would expect that there is also release uh, during aerobic exercise, but potentially the uh, lower level of release. But we don't know this. Nobody, nobody has quantified yet. And this still should be done. And um, it's uh, just the studies that um, should really approach that in the future and compare different types of exercise directly. Very good. I okay, think we so, might be able to yeah, go ahead. add a little bit there as well. So before we started our study, there was a number of studies like Eve Maria's, and it was using fairly intense exercise. So our study was actually done uh, with really moderate intensity exercise with both young and older populations. Uh, and really, we saw the effect that the EVs being released was increased apart from older population who didn't have any sort of exercise background. Uh, so that was quite interesting to us. So they, they really didn't have much response at all, uh, but we were at a moderate intensity. So maybe if you went higher, like some other studies, we may see some differences. But yeah, the, the, the level of uh, intensity of the exercise certainly seemed to be good at releasing, uh, even at moderate levels, but age certainly played a, played a role in what we observed. Very interesting. So the, the study population is also important. It's important to know, know so, about them, yeah. So I agree with that. And if I may add one one thing, I think ideally, ideally we should compare the same idea individual doing aerobic exercise and exhaustive exercise uh, because what we also see is a huge difference between the individuals and we see kind of uh, strong responders and uh, lower responders although I think our um, group our uh, a group of, 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 of study subjects was quite homogeneous all of them were young, quite young and quite sportive they were kind of athletes um, but there is a huge difference between the individuals, I have to say. I saw some hands go up. Uh, Dylan, Aisha, and Steve, in that order, please. Yeah, so we, we um, I mean, our exercise was standardized to approximate moderate intensity, but even within that, there was a range. Um, and we did try to look at it within the range. We didn't see any major influence, but that's, you know, that's within like 40 to 60% of heart rate reserve, so not, not a wide range. And I would just add that we've done, uh, in addition to the different types of exercise, I think there's so many different variables that we have to look at. Uh, exercise in the morning versus exercise at night, there could be a circadian effect in the amount of EVs that are released within the same individual, depending on the time of the day. There could be sex and gender effects that no one has looked at, and there's so much work that needs to be done. Uh, we published a paper where we saw that depending on the type of EVs that you're releasing, it may even identify whether you are an exercise responder or non-responder uh, afterwards. So that there's so much, so much there to distill and decipher. So it's a really important question that I think uh, we all have to work towards. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, just piggybacking off that comment, um, you know, it's not just intensity and modes as we're talking about, but something else I just consider there is uh, what time are the EVs being measured and what are we talking about? You know, I think in, in sort of classic exercise physiology, you know, perspectives, um, the immediate post-exercise effect can look very different than anywhere from four plus hours into the next day. You know, so that's an important consideration as I think some literature will even say, exercise raises EV levels, and then others say they suppress them or lower them. Um, so I know at least for, for us, we've been cognizant of that to try and get ourselves away from the immediate post-exercise effect, thinking, well, what does this mean for the next day? And we've done that a little bit more in relations to concepts of insulin sensitivity and vascular function, given we know things like oxidative stress and inflammation are a bit higher immediately post versus hours later. And then you start tying in diet with that, as there's evidence saying if you 
replete calories, you can negate many health benefits of the exercise, which was his little head scratching in a way. But what does that mean for the EV? I don't, I don't know if we really understand that. So it's a great question. And, and I think it's an area of work we need to keep at. Martin. Yeah, I totally agree with, with all these comments. The, um, I think, um, there's a lot, a lot of work to do clearly, hopefully with uh, sort of 90 people on the call, hopefully some, some can step up and, and join the, join the EV club. But, um, I think one point I'd like to make probably is, um, I'm not sure we're even sure what an exercise EV looks like in terms of its phenotype. Um, it's, we're potentially looking at different subtypes of EVs being released. Um, it, it's almost a little bit like the, the efforts made in the EV community to, to actually characterize what is a small EV, what is a, a large EV. And of course, we're still not 100% uh, clear on that anyway. So these are some of the challenges that we've got when, um, when actually choosing what is the most appropriate analytical approach to, to come up with these questions. But hopefully we, we can certainly get there. Thank you, Uta. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Yeah, thank you for this great discussion. I, I just want to make a comment that I think EVs could be powerful tools to understand the effect of exercise. Uh, Steve and I had one of our first studies. We found that endothelium platelet derived EVs were higher in obese adults with poor fitness compared to people with very poor fitness. And we found these subtle differences. And I found that quite intriguing that EVs can be a powerful tool. Good. Uh, just because it's related to to this, um, Devika follows up by asking, um, "What about muscle micro tears? So, in other words, the damage that's uh, that's occurring." Um, and and this, the, it was actually Genevieve's question that made me think of this too, because you know what is being released from muscles that are, you know, that are undergoing some stress. There is there do 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 we do we know anything about that yet, or is that is that another place where we we just need more work? I think uh, Sri Nair's uh, group um, over at the Mayo Clinic has done some work on this, again, with um, an unbiased pronomic analysis. Uh, they did both uh, endurance type um, aerobic exercise and also like a, a resistance exercise. And certainly um, the, the, the effects seem to be much, much lower with the uh, resistance exercise. So um, there's maybe less to work with in terms of phenotyping those EVs when, when they're released. Great. Well, so next question here in the chat box, box is from, uh, is it Leon? Let me go ahead and ask your question. Okay. I'm Caleb from Brazilian Army Institute of Biology and Tung University here in, uh, in Germany. I would like to know a little bit more about, for example, endurance adapted athletes. Uh, they have uh, different proportions of muscle fiber types fibers typers compared to re resistance adapted athletes or even to sedentary or occasionally active subjects. This can be variable even in different muscles because of this, for example, it's too important to use liquid biopsies. And what could we expect about variability of the EVs in adapted in, di in different adapted athletes because the exercise for physiology is totally different from sedentary and adapted athletes. Thank you. Anybody want to tackle that one? Uh, I, mean, I think I think Eva Maria made a, a made reference to it in her talk about it's not 100% clear what the contribution skeletal muscle is, is making to the to the the the, 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 the release. It's certainly not as big as perhaps we might have thought um, when we were first uh, looking at, at exercise EVs. You think of exercise, it's very much a muscle-centric sort of, of activity, um, but certainly the data so far, using the, the current techniques that we have, uh, doesn't seem to be a, a huge uh, contribution. 5% um, has been uh, banded around a little bit. So again, I don't think we have the data to be able to, to, to answer these in terms of uh, specific fiber type. That's my point. If, I'm not sure if anyone else has got any, uh, any ideas. I would add 
But I agree with that, Martin. I think Dan Lark uh, published a really nice paper showing skeletal muscle derived DVs and their percent contribution in plasma after exercise. And it's clearly not as much as some of the other cell types, but that doesn't mean it's uh, not important. And maybe less is more, and maybe the, the amount that is there is enough to cause some kind of an effect. And I think there might be a fiber type effect, but we have to really do concentrated studies to distill that and and it would require a lot of collaboration and hopefully work together with people to to get to that point. So definitely agree. Thank you, Dylan. Yeah, just uh, to reiterate that less is more point, right? It doesn't have to be a large percentage if it's going from zero or a very small amount to like a meaningful amount, right? Good point, and Jason? Yeah, and I'd probably say, uh, it might be interesting to think about the uptake as well. So muscle cells can definitely take up EVs and potentially different muscle cells will take them up at different rates. Fit individuals may, may have the benefit of having better uptake for some reason. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns that we really need to work on. Yeah, that's the other side of the equation, right? I mean, it's not just what's being released, but also what is being, being taken up during and after exercise. Great, great reminder there. Um, Uta, I know you have to, you have to get going. Um, do you want to quickly just... Uh, make your comment about the, the dynamic process? Yeah, I, I think we touched it already. Um, yeah, Ken also it. said it, it really depends. These studies are all very different. We can't compare them because people have different exercise pro, uh, protocols, different timing. So do you get the blood immediately afterwards when the EVs can be excited? Exercise is a big stimulus. Or as uh, Steve, you can comment on that, we measure the next morning or after our 14 days of treatment and found differences. So. I think this puts a lot of complexity into our questions uh, and it's very dynamic, I assume. Yes. Very good. Thank, thank you for the comments, Uta. Um, now we have a question about our fellow travelers on this exercise journey, Samuel. Yes, if anyone has investigated the role of exercise um, in terms derived extracellular vesicles. And I would imagine a lot of you use blood samples and. Samuel, sorry, I, the audio cut out for me. I'm not sure if everybody else. Yeah, same. Uh, we're having audio problems. So I'm, I'm going to just read read the comment here. Sorry, sorry about that, Samuel. Um, it, it's about, it, it's about the, the microbiome. So um, Samuel asks, I, or says, I would imagine that the blood samples would also have microbiota derived EVs. And if so, what specific markers have been used? Has, has any of you looked at um, uh, EVs from, from, um, from other organisms that might be in the blood? Eya, do you want to comment on this? <laughs> yeah, I, I was just going to open my microphone. So uh, we didn't really uh, look the EV markers, but when we uh, do the sequencing for the EVs, we definitely see also uh, RNAs coming from RNA particles coming from from the microbiota and general. It can be like environmental microbes or coming from the nutrition or anywhere. So we don't really know that, but definitely that's correct that there there is in the blood bloodstream also also EVs from other yeah. As if things weren't already complicated enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Good. All right. So, um, Debbie, you have a couple of questions. And I just want to say we have reached the end of our hour, but if anybody's able to stick around, we'll, we'll be, be happy to do that um, to just get through the questions here. Um, but if people do have to go, that's fine. Hey, thank you. Um, thanks. It's been such a fantastic session. So I have a question for Dr. Salim. Wonderful work about the CHARS data. So I think you mentioned that after proteinase or triton um, lysis, you basically lose the effects of increased mitochondrial biogenesis. Can you talk a little bit to that? Uh, do you think that this means that the effect of EVs are mediate, mediated by their surface molecules? as opposed to their vesicular content, like our miRNA or something like that? Um, yeah, that's a great question, Dr. Manikam. Thank you for that. And I, I completely concur with that interpretation. Uh, based on the data, it appears that it's either the surface proteins may be embedded in the membrane or even the corona proteins or 
combination of both that seem to be causing this increase in EV mediated uh, oxygen consumption. Um, we, the, when we add both Triton and Proteus K, it looked like the consumption, uh, maximum oxygen consumption was even lower than PBS. So there might even be deleterious effects of adding whatever is left after you digest all the proteins in and out. Uh, but that wasn't a significant. So it's, 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 I guess the important question now is which proteins are causing that effect. So we're, we're actively pursuing that and it's, it's quite exciting for us to hopefully think, come up with an answer in a year or so. Uh, and I'm, can I, if I can ask one more quick follow-up, uh, did you just look at the small EVs or were your EVs kind of uh, a combination of both small and large EVs? Uh, so we used um, differential ultracentrifugation to isolate EVs, which does enrich for the smaller EVs. Uh, but we had a range, if you remember, in the, the there was a histogram. So there was it went from zero all the way up to about 150, 200. Uh, and we didn't really see a difference, a big difference in the size distribution with, with our chronic stem protocol. We did see an increase in concentration overall. So we took whatever was released and we put it on other cells. Uh, but there could be species specific effect and who knows if that translates if you're using other means of EV isolation if you do SEC or something else I mean EV research itself is so complicated and you combine that with exercise and you got lots of complications so That's, it's a great study regardless um, I was asking that question about small versus larger EVs because there are a few studies out there showing that the larger EVs carry mitochondrial components so I was wondering if any of the increases in oxygen consumption rate could be a function of EV mitochondria or mitochondrial components in EVs. Thank you. Am I also allowed to ask my second question or? Uh, yes, yes, go ahead. Thank yeah. you. Uh, and this is a question uh, for Dr. Vitham. Again, great work. I was uh, in, curious again to look uh, to know if you had also looked at large EVs, release of large EVs uh, post the HIT workout. Um, the short answer is no, um, that the assay is directed to um, to small EVs. But having said that, as I briefly mentioned, um, so things like CD9, for example, has been detected in larger vesicles, and that's what's used to anchor. Uh, uh, it's one of the one of the antibodies that's used to anchor. So not specifically, but I'm I'm sure we're probably picking up some large vesicles in that prep for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I think um, that, that also goes to a question that Catherine asked later here um, about the, the different subtypes of EVs. Um, now, um, I'm just going to try to summarize these last few questions quickly. Um, so Gao asks about uh, skeletal, uh, skeletal muscle EVs specifically. Do we have specific markers for, for muscle cells so that we can say this EV did come from this muscle? Or is that, or is that something that we, that we don't yet have? I'm no. just going to jump in and no, sorry. No, you uh, go. I'll let, okay. I was just going to say there are, uh, this work by, um, uh, I the name just disappeared from my mind, but alpha, alpha sarcoglycan is used as a marker for muscle EVs. And, um, I let Martin add his viewpoint. Go ahead, Martin. Sorry. Yeah. I think, I think there's some work showing that alpha sarcoglycan probably isn't one of the best, better ones. Um, um, some of the, um, Sarcoplasmic, uh, sorry, the um, the circa proteins, of course, are very specific to um, to muscle. So ATP two A one has often been used as a as a potential uh, potential marker. It, it, again, just going back to whether skeletal muscle does actually contribute. You know, we did um, an arterial venous balance study, uh, part of the paper that I, uh, I presented, and we did detect a, a significant rate of release of of some EVs from that. Um, from that analysis, whether they are muscle specific or part of the uh, the circ uh, circulation or the vasculature, uh, of course, we don't know with that technique. So, um, yeah, I think once we get more um, uh, specific markers of, of, of different cell types in the muscle, uh, then we can get much better understanding of, of, of the type of release in, in, in the exercise context. Yeah. Very good. All right. Um, question from Ian here. That's a follow up um, on the study that Jason and MC did. Um, did you attempt to examine EV release in younger individuals exercising at the same absolute intensity as the older ones? 
um, and that would be to determine whether this uh, lack of EV release was was due to aging or or an absolute change in metabolic rate. So the answer is no. Uh, so we use relative um, exercise intensity to kind of like standardize the exercise intensity across the groups. Okay. Yep. Thank, thank you. Um, and then uh, final question here from Catherine. I think this is a good one to end on. Um, this is about whether there are specific EV markers. Do you think that there will be EV markers that are upregulated in athletes versus non-athletes, something that we could maybe use in the future as a measure of overall healthiness? Dylan. Yeah, I actually think that the second half of the question uh, there may, may provide some insights in, in the type of EV being formed. And I think this this idea of a shift between large and small EV formation may be something that we can use to infer health um, with, you know, you know, the large EVs coming from stress and, and membrane blebbing, where it's typically a stress response, whereas uh, the small ones typically come from more physiological origins. And I think We've been looking a lot at that in the context of diabetes, um, where we do think we see a shift in, in that um, in the dynamics of formation. And I think that may be a starting point for using the EV formation as a as a measure of health. Yeah, just to add to that, it's, it's a really great question, and it's a really intriguing question to, to to have whether we can actually phenotype someone's health based on a on a circulating EV marker. I, I think. One of the things that we've tried to focus on is um, when we do, we were very absolutely surprised by some of the things we're picking up um, in uh, EVs with a, an unbiased quantitative uh, proteomic approach. Uh, importantly, up to 80% of the 5,000 proteins or so that we detected uh, didn't have a, a signal peptide. So even though we are uh, extracting them from blood, um, they don't have a a, a known classical means to, to to get out into that circulation. So kind of intriguing um, that that there are really interesting things circulating in EVs in the context of exercise. Well, thank you, Martin. And I think we're going to leave it there. Those are our last words on EVs and exercise and the future of, of what we might be able to do with them. So uh, thank, thanks to everybody uh, for your stamina, if you will and staying with us a little bit after the hour. Um, and a particular thanks to our panelists, our presenters today. Um, it's uh, it's really been a pleasure to learn more about your work. Um, I can't believe that we made this actually actually happen today, um, but it's been, it's been very informative for me. Um, and I hope that maybe this session can help to stimulate more collaborations in the future. Maybe some funding agencies out there are gonna pump some money into this too, to, to help us really understand the complexities here. So, um, so thank you all again. Hope you all have a great rest of the week and we look forward to seeing you hopefully at ISO 2023 next week. Still, still time to register if you haven't registered yet and you can make it to Seattle. Um, but if not, we'll see you uh, again on a future EV club. Thanks again.